Okay, everyone. It is officially 8.30 p.m. My name is Ron. I'm an alcoholic. Happy holidays to you guys and coming Happy New Year to everybody. And uh, we got a little special treat tonight. We're going to really mix this up. Uh, our speaker scheduled for today was diagnosed with COVID this, this afternoon and uh, can't make it here tonight. So what we're going to do is a little different. We're going to do like a little gratitude meeting. We have uh, six different people come up and speak for about 10 minutes. Give it a little festive cheer since this is the last meeting of the year for us at this group. And uh, we won't hit New Year's and, and you got Christmas in a day or two, right? One night, tomorrow night, Christmas Eve. So we'll kind of condense this and have some fun with this. So with that, let's bring uh, Nick up here, world's greatest sheriff person. Let's welcome him. Welcome to the Conscious Contact, speaker of Alcoholics Anonymous. My name is Nick and I'm an alcoholic. Amen. And welcome home. This is a one-hour speaker meeting that meets every Saturday evening at St. Paul's Lutheran Church, 301 North Main Street in Doylestown, Pennsylvania. Food and fellowship starts at 8 p.m., followed by our speaker at 8.30. The business meeting for this group meets every Saturday at 7 p.m. to 7.30 right here. Please come early and join us. The purpose of this group is to provide a consistent message of hope and recovery through God reliance and service to others in the practice and teaching of the 12 steps. We record all speakers and others may benefit from the message of recovery. If you wish not to be recorded, simply ask. This is an open meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. The group would like to welcome everyone, especially newcomers. Is there anyone new or from out of town that would like to introduce themselves with their first name? Yes, sir. Uh, Brian, hey, Brian. Hey, Brian. Welcome. Hello. Hey, Frampton. Hey, welcome. Rodney, hey, Robbie, Robbie, welcome. Kenny, welcome. Hey, Kenny, welcome. Mika, welcome. Good to see everybody. And welcome to everybody. All right. The Conscious Contact Speaker Group encourages sponsorship. Would anyone with working knowledge of the 12 steps and is willing to sponsor, please raise your hands. Excellent. Are there any announcements for the good of AA? I have two announcements. Um, on Monday, there's an alcathon from 9 to 2, 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. It's in uh, Sellersville on Green Street. I have a flyer for that if anyone's interested. Awesome way to uh, work on your recovery. Nice little workshop. And then um, on New Year's in Percocy, the at Virginia and Dill Street at St. Andrew's Church, there's a New Year's Eve celebration. I have a flyer for that as well. Um, we're going to be doing a non-denominational uh, mass service from 7.30 AA uh, members only. And they're going to be doing burning of resentments in the courtyard, kind of a cool thing. And then uh, followed by a speaker at 9, and then food fun fellowship, dancing, all that stuff, disco ball, lights, all that good stuff. Um, I have a flyer for that too if anyone's interested. A great way to uh, stay sober and bring in the new year. Our sister group is a big book study meeting that meets every Thursday at 7.30 just up the street at the Salem UCC Church, 186 East Court Street uh, in Doylestown, Pennsylvania, and the coffee is on at 6.15. We have meeting lists and big books on easy terms. Please see me or any home group member after the meeting. If you cannot afford a big book, the Conscious Contact Speaker Group will give you one at no charge. Anyone willing to make donations for the purchase of big books and CDs to help those who can't afford them can put donations in the jar on the tail mark big book and CD donations. And all CDs are available free of charge. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel, the Conscious Contact Speaker Group of Doylestown, PA, and our Facebook group, subscribe and share. You can find our speakers there, join our Facebook page, and keep informed and share upcoming events and meetings. And now with that, I have Brian to come up and read the Just for Today Prayer of Recovery. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Brian, and I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Brian. This is Just for Today, a prayer of recovery. Just for today, I will be agreeable. I will look as well as I can, dress becomingly, talk low, act courteously, criticize not one bit, not find fault with anything, and not try to improve or regulate anybody except myself. And with that, I'm going to have JJ come up here. JJ is going to read a preamble. My name is JJ. I'm an alcoholic. Amen. Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength, and hope with each other that they may solve their common problem and help other alcoholics to help others to recover from alcoholism. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. There are no dues or fees for AA membership. We are self-supporting through our own contributions. 
AA is not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organizations, institutions, does not wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorses nor opposes any causes. Our primary purpose is to stay sober and help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. I have asked Steve to come up and read the AA 12 Steps of Recovery. Good evening, everybody. Steve Alcoholic. Hey, Steve. 12 Steps. Oh, I think I know by now. Here, I still read them just to make sure. 12 Steps of Recovery. We admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. Two, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. Four, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Five, admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Six, we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Seven, humbly asked him to remove these shortcomings. Eight, made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Nine, made direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when, when to do so would injure them or others. Ten, continued to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. Eleven, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for the knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. Twelve, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. And now we will proceed with Nick. The Seven Tradition. Every AA group ought to be fully self-supported, including outside contributions. At this time, we'd like to pass the baskets. We have no dues or fees. We do have expenses, and this group provides many services. Your donations cover food, rent, big books, CDs, events, and workshops. And there's absolutely no smoking on church property. Please take a moment to silence all cell phones and limit movement during the meeting to avoid distractions. Now, to introduce our speaker, a good friend of the Conscious Contact Speaker Group, me. <laughs> My name is Nick. I'm an alcoholic, and I've been waiting for seven years to get this get this podium. So there's a justified resentment in the process there. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to do my best uh, right now just to uh, you know try to let God speak through me, um, and that's why I found my life is much better that way. Um, so in 2009, I, I went to my first rehab. Well, let's start from the beginning. In 1975, I was born. I have 10 minutes to tell you my life. So. Now, in uh, 2009, I was introduced to, my, to, to, to recovery um, I, I had an intervention. My family gave me an intervention, and I went to Living Grin and uh, saw the, you know, what was going on there, and you know, I didn't like it, and, and um, sitting in these classes, and, and on the wall, there was the steps and the traditions, and there was, you know, a big book going around, and uh, the famous painting of the man in the bed with, with Bill Dodson, and and there's a skinny, disheveled-looking man in that bed, and I looked at that, and I, I can relate to that. I didn't know who those two guys were at the time. I had no idea, but I can relate to that guy in the bed. Uh, people coming to me when I was, you know, in bad shape and, and pleading with me and begging me and trying to offer me help and, and not, not, not uh, receiving it, not, not accepting it. Uh, so for seven years, I, I fought this. I fought this thing, you know, it was painful to, uh, un to learn what I've truly really suffered from what I was up against and being unwilling to really do anything about it um, and suffering in and around the rooms, more, more around the rooms of AA for seven years. Um, by God's grace, I uh, picked the phone up for once and, and, and got a bed at Penn Foundation. It was my fifth time there. And, you know, I joked about it the other night that, uh, you know, I get excited when I go back to rehab. I'm going to see some of the counselors. They remember me, right? And you know, they look at like, "What are you doing here again?" I'm like, "Aren't you glad to see me?" Like, you know, that's how sick my mind was. Um, and again, you know, I, I in that first rehab, I, I couldn't, I couldn't comprehend or believe that this was the solution to my to my drinking and drug problem. These steps in this book, 
I, I just I couldn't comprehend. I, and I just I looked at it and I saw, I saw no value in it. I didn't understand. Uh, and there was no no willingness there, no open mindedness, no honesty. And uh, and I suffered for many many years um, until I got to that point of, of brokenness and and uh, beat into a state of reasonableness. The book talks about that. The willingness was there with desperation and you know, many years of, of, of trial and error and multiple, multiple surrenders, multiple, you know, first step. You know, this truly was a real first step experience I had where I was so beaten and broken that I, I, I was ready to accept, um, you know, what you guys were offering me. Uh, the greatest word ever I said was okay. You know, I said okay to, to whatever was asked of me. It started in that rehab. I had a change of heart. Our book talks about that, having a, just a change of heart. Like something came over me that I was like ready, you know, I was, and it was a relief. Like maybe it, maybe this is it. Maybe I am truly done. And I thought I had those moments before, but we have this mental blank spot that occurs. And in time, we forget the pain and suffering of even the day, previous day. And I pick up again. I make an insane decision to do what just, what, you know, what would almost kill me again and again and again. Um, so by God's grace, on April 19, 2016, I, I checked into that rehab and, and, and had some, uh, really, I feel like I had a spiritual experience, a spiritual awakening and right in that rehab where um, I felt like God moved through me and, and something changed internally that I had not felt before. There was this willingness and just the desperation, um, you know, that I, would, I, was, I was praying to God and asking God for help and really begging God for mercy uh, to make it stop. And, and I meant it this time wholeheartedly, which I, I thought I did before, but this, this was different. There was a different earnestness inside me that uh, I truly felt like this might be the one and, and uh, broke down with some of the counselors and, and talked like I never did before and shed some of my skin and peeled down some of the layers and, and broke down the walls, which I never had done before and opened up to people, you know, and steer clear of some of the drama going on in the rehab and just said, okay, when they, you know, when they asked me to do things and that, that was the beginning of, of, the, of the willingness and all the suggestions they made to me, you know, after that were um, stuff I fought. You know, going to the recovery house, I said, okay, wherever you'll let me go, because I'm homeless. I'm, I remember I have, I'm not doing so good. I got nowhere to go. I should be thankful if I have it. They're going to be willing to take and give me a bed, you know, and I had this different attitude. So I went and, and, um, and thus began a, a journey of recovery. I got a sponsor pretty quickly. Um, I had one before, but, it, you know, I left them hanging. You know, that's what I do. I burn people, I, I leave them guessing and wondering and hoping and praying and, and leave him in the dark. And one of my first sponsors, you know, when I would slip and he would just say the kindest words ever, it wasn't, didn't tell me what to do. He just said, just come back to us. Nick, just come back to us. And that stuck with me. And I say that to many, many guys because they don't want to hear, they don't want to be told what to do because I, I know I didn't. So, um, got a sponsor right away. Uh, he encouraged me to do a four step right away. You know, I'd been around the rooms for a while and had some idea of, of recovery, asking you know, my relationship with God, and I, I thought I was starting to have one. Uh, you know, I started, started to pray daily, you know, those prayer cards they hand out at every meeting. I was reading that every morning, get on my knees and saying these prayers from the heart, and something started to change, that peace and serenity started coming over me, uh, just, from the, just from that beginning of prayer and meditation and early recovery, you know, and finding the time, not making time for God, finding time for God every morning, and something, something started to change internally, and Wrote out that four step. I took a day and just like sat down at the at the recovery house at the kitchen table and just just did it. You know, I always balk on that one. And finally, there was uh, some action being taken. You know, and the sponsor came over and we we shared our experiences together. And it was uh you know not like I had ever I thought it would be because the anticipation and the, you know all that stuff that I think it's gonna be some type of way. It's, it, it wasn't. It was a really nice experience. And, he shared some of his stories, and I shared mine, and, and pointed out some 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 facts that you know that I was not aware of, and uh, and I was okay with that. Again, uh, I'd never done that before, and, and I truly, when I was done that, I felt like I was I was starting to really do AA. And I never had that feeling before. Like I'd never I was in a pro, never in a program of recovery. I was around the rooms, but never had felt this. Like I was actually doing something in the rooms of AA. And he encouraged me to get in the service right away. So I, you know, I started making coffee. I had no license, no way to get around or do anything. So I, I put my hand up at a meeting and said, look, I'm willing to make coffee. Is anybody willing to get me here to make the coffee? And that was uh, big on my part because I don't want to ask for help. I don't want to like look like, like, I, like I need help, you know, and um, or, look, or look needy. So that was another beginning of, of uh, something changing in me that I had never done before. And 
I was surprised how willing people were to help. You know, the guy got me to the meeting, showed me how to make the coffee, and you know, and, and that was the, that in the beginning. And I got excited to learn to uh, get to that point of where you know some places like require a certain amount of days of sobriety to chair a meeting, and I couldn't wait to get to that mark, the thirty day mark, and you know, I could put my name on the list and chair a meeting. And this this was an attitude I'd never had before. Um, I had chair meetings before, but I wasn't one hundred percent sober. I was lying, you know, to myself and to the rooms, living dishonestly. So, just that uh, the honesty that in my program I had never had before uh, that was, you know, not there was there, and uh, just I just immersed myself. I threw myself into recovery, and you know, eventually, of course, I, I started dating somebody, and the girl's like, "Man, you do AA alcoholically?" I'm like, "Well, I have to." I'm like, "My life depends on it." Like, I, and she didn't understand it. But I do. I know that, um, you know, the, the biggest question is, like, how long can I continue to do this like my life depends on it? You know, that desperation, when it starts to drift away, you start to like, do I really need to do this so much anymore? Do I really need to come here on a Saturday, every Saturday, and be here? Do I need to do this anymore? And uh, it's a reminder, you know, that I, I don't want to find out what happens if I stop because it's, my life has gotten so good with, um, with putting this work and putting the time in and, and just making it, most importantly, making it fun. We do have a lot of fun here, so um, I hope I help somebody tonight. We're going to move on to the next speaker. Uh, we have Nancy. Hi, you guys. I'm Nancy. I'm an alcoholic. Hey. And uh, today I celebrate 41 years. So, I mean, say what you will, it feels good, yeah. right? And uh, it always does. I mean, every day I've been sober, it's been great. But no matter what, I haven't picked up a drink or a drug under any and all conditions. I was told, you guys told me, did I say I'm an alcoholic? I did, because that's coming closer, talking to the mic. Because you know what? Yeah, I was too far back, but I didn't want to hear what I was hearing. Just an echo. Okay, you keep me in line here, Rob. Um, so I did say I'm Nancy. I'm an alcoholic because that's going to be the most important thing I say. I grew up in a family of uh, nine kids, two parents, both alcoholic. One died when I was thirteen. My mom lived, she became one really after that. I always, I probably came out of the womb ripping and running. I was a nervous kid. I, I was a seventh of all those people and like I didn't know what to do. And really nobody, everybody was really sweet. But I didn't feel like I had a place, like I didn't have my space. Seriously, lived over top of a garage, which my father built this house. Five girls, single beds. It was like the storybook of Madeline. Single beds, uh, side table, backboards. We used to do somersaults down our beds before we go to bed at night. Eight o'clock was time for sleep, and I realized the reason my parents had to drink. So come hell or high water, we were all going to be going to bed at 8 o'clock, and we got in a lot of trouble. But um, we had some fun, too. And uh, so like I say, I just I was a nervous kid. I remember in second grade, I couldn't read out loud. And uh, I didn't think I was too smart. And so I was very insecure. I stuttered. and. I mean, that I can stand here and not stutter, have a master's in exercise science, undergrad in psychology, made my way to the rooms when I was 25 years old, did not go to rehab. The morning I got, had my last drink, I woke up in the morning, because I was doing some bad stuff at this point. I already had an accident in my car about two months before, and I went over and uh, looked in the mirror. I was getting ready to go or whatever and go back to work. And I said, are you an alcoholic? You know, nope. 
went on, had a great day at work. I was living with a guy I moved here to be with from Rochester, New York. We were together for the year and we had said we would get married. So I went along because I figured, you know, why not? Not why, why not? And um, not so good. Anyway, I decided I would just come home after I finished work at five o'clock and not go to the bar. I usually did go to the bar. And I know I came to it around seven, maybe eight o'clock. I was at the bar. And then I didn't go home yet, but I left at about 9.30. Next thing you know, I'm in Lankanau Hospital, no recollection how I got there. Fortunately, didn't hurt anybody else. I refused medical treatment. I was afraid. I was still, I was just so afraid. The next day, long story short, I was treated and released. I woke up and I said, God, if you will see me fit, I'm here to stay. I knew because my mom had gotten in here two years before. I had just asked her four months before. Any chance you can give me some tips how to avoid where you're going, even though I love you there? Yeah, I needed it, but I don't want to be that guy. And she goes, yeah, and she went through all the reasons we all read in the big book. I'm like, how'd she get all this so quick? I'm sure and I'll roll right off her lips. And I went, you know what? I broke every one of those suggestions in those four months. And I knew it was, I was done. Because I was going to, you know, I didn't mind dying particularly, but I didn't want to kill anybody. And I knew that that was what was going to happen. Something really bad was going to happen. So I got in here, I got involved. Not that involved that quick. I was a slow start. Without the rehab, that's like a slow start. So I ended up, though, making my way. I got a sponsor, worked the steps. I remember doing my fourth step in front of everybody like this. Joy of Living, Springfield, Delaware County, 7.30 on a Thursday night, still there. And said all the dirty, put all the dirty laundry out there. Felt better. Somebody said to me afterwards, you know, you don't have to do that again. I'm glad you did. I'm like, okay, and I didn't. And I went through, I did all the steps, and I've helped other people do the steps. And, um, but anyway, what I want to tell you is like, you know, we all know how to drink. That's a foregone conclusion. That's why we're here. How I stay sober is I found this higher power who I really had left. And when I came into AA, the religion of my youth really gave me the stability of the spirituality that was here. So I took that, brought it here, brought this there, and I just kind of locked in on a say a prayer in the morning, say a prayer at night, hit your knees. And I didn't do that for about 10 years. And then I realized, you know what, how about, a, let's play that why not game, okay? Let's play that card here. So instead of why I hit my knees, I went, why not hit my knees? So I did a why not, I hit my knees, I had a great day, hit my knees again, had a great day, thanked them at night on my knees, things were going good, missed the day, started driving, I was like, uh-oh, I didn't hit my knees, say in prayer. I'm like, I don't feel good. I'm telling you, I felt off. I went, as soon as I could, hit my knees, kept going, never looked back. Other than one time, six months in, I told the group, because I was going to meetings, you know, we say, you know, kind of like a meeting makers make it, but it's really meetings are important because you hear the things you wouldn't hear if you aren't in a meeting, right? So I'm in this meeting, I go, hey, you guys have been great. I'm good. And I said, thanks so much for everything. And I'm going to, like, head out. Not that night, no rough, right? But, you know, they're like, well, that's a great idea, Nancy. You know, just don't drink. How about this? Don't drink. Come back next week. You don't have to come back after that. But just come back and tell us how you did it. <laughs> so I come back the next week, and I go, oh, my God, you guys, what if I didn't come back? I never looked back. Never had to go back, pick up a drink or a drug. Truly, I've had to quit about everything I love because I don't like things. I love things. When I like it, I love it. When I love it, I do it too much. 
and it causes problems. So just like with alcoholism, if, if alcohol causes you problems, plural, you probably have a problem with alcohol. And I have a problem with alcohol, I have a problem with cigarettes, I have a problem with sex, relationships, jobs, you know, gambling, you know, name it. I could name it, I don't know, maybe exercise, but I didn't really ever get that bad at that because I never did. Anyway, um, but there's a few I nevers out there in all the, all the categories. What I'm telling you is that person I am is that kid that came out of the room ripping and running. And any chance you give me, I will just put my whole self into it. And you know what? I, this, at this point, I'll tell you, 40 years, just get to 40 years, it's cake. That's all I have, thanks. Bye. And I think we got Liz. Hi everyone, I'm Liz, an alcoholic. It was funny, on um, before I came here, me and my boyfriend were getting pizza earlier, and I happened to see Ron's post for Conscious Contact, and I'm like, there's no speaker listed. And um, I was like, I'd be so nervous to get up at this podium, like this is so intimidating. And I walk in and Ron was like, hey Liz, I got a favor to ask you. I'm like, yeah, of course, no problem, what's up? And he's like, can you speak for 10 or 15 minutes on gratitude? And my mind is like, anything but that, Ron, please, no. Um, but that is the fear talking. I don't want to be up here and be judged. I want to hear, feel like I don't have a message um, that holds weight and depth because I hear wonderful speakers here week in and week out. Um, and it's the fear telling me that my message isn't good enough, that I'm not going to be able to help someone. But that's not the truth. Ron also said, you know, we need women to get up there. And that's a conversation that I just had with somebody the other day where I can walk into a meeting and there's maybe a handful of women and the rest are men. And I want to be available for the women that need the help. Um, so to speak a little bit on gratitude, uh, my, uh, my sobriety date's October 21st of 2014. Um, and the first two to three years sober, got a sponsor, had a home group, worked through the steps, and life got really good really quick. And I definitely took a step back from AA for probably about three or four years. And in that time, definitely just a dry drunk. Um, not concerned with how my actions were harming other people. Um, totally consumed with self. Had a gambling problem. Um, and it really cost me a lot. And I was sober through this. And about a year and a half, two years ago, um, hit a really rough patch in my life and knew that things needed to change. And it was intuition knowing that even though I haven't picked up a drink, I need to go back to AA. I need to rely on God because that's what had worked before and relying on self has not been helpful for me in the past couple years. It's got me to a really dark place. So I came back and I had another spiritual experience. Um, and this past year and a half, I've just learned so much. And one of the major things that I've learned is that, and that I'm so grateful for, is that your comfort zone is going to lead to little to no growth. It's the things like getting up at this podium and being uncomfortable that are going to, you know, present you with the biggest opportunities to grow. And as much as my mind was saying no, and all the fear is saying no, I don't want to be up here tonight, I knew I was presented with that opportunity because I could get up here, I could do it, and I have a message of weight and depth that needs to be shared with other people. So that is definitely one thing that I'm grateful for right now. 
Another big part of my recovery, kind of coming back into AA this time around the past few years, is I didn't take the fellowship super seriously as far as making friends and having people outside of meetings to lean on. You know, I'd come in, say hi to the same couple people. Every single time, you know, the people that I felt comfortable around didn't go out of my way to greet a newcomer, um, you know, or to introduce myself to just a new face that I had never met before. And this time around, the amount of friends and people that I have that I could reach out to on any given day is just amazing. And they hold me accountable when I can't hold myself accountable or when I'm not holding myself up to, you know, the 12 step standards um, where, you know, you want to be honest, you want to be thorough, you want to um, worry about somebody other than yourself, not be so stuck in self. And I have friends that will call me out on that today. It's so important. And going to my home group, which I rely on so much week in and week out, where before I loved, you know, loved going to speaker meetings or discussion meetings where I could sit in the back and blend in with the crowd and not have to raise my hand, not have to share what's actually on my mind. You know, uh, Nick brought up honesty as a big part of his program this time around. And when you can actually tell people in your life where you're at, how you're feeling, not the good, but also the bad, when you can just be at a soul level with someone and say, this is exactly how I'm feeling and not feel like you need to hold anything back. Um, that's when you get connected to yourself and then open yourself up to have that conscious contact with God. Um, and that has been a huge lesson that I'm so grateful for again. Um, you know, the past year and a half, my mom um, had gotten diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer and she's had it twice before. Um, but this time, you know, it will be fatal. And although she's in the best possible spot that she can be in, it's times like this, you know, around the holidays, um, where I can sit and be and enjoy her company and not be in my head, enjoy the company of, I have a daughter who's turning two in March, you know, and not be wrapped up with whatever crap I've got going on. I can be there for them. I can be of service. Um, and I can show up as the woman that I want to be, and that is because of all of you, it's because of the 12 steps, and that's because of having a conscious contact with God. So that's all I got, um, and I will introduce JJ as our next speaker. Again, my name is JJ. I'm an alcoholic. So I'm fairly new to fairly new to talking about anything related to me and alcoholism. I don't know how I got thrown in this mix with these wonderful speakers prior to me, but we're going to do our best. Bear with me. So I um, was raised in a family that was a little chaotic, a little broken home, alcoholics throughout the family, grandmas, grandpas. That's not the reason I drink. You know, it's, it's all, it all comes back to the disease of alcoholism and me being not comfortable in my own skin. As, as far as I can remember back, I'd spin in a chair prior to being introduced to drugs or alcohol. I'd spin in circles just to feel anything other than, than normal. Um, and that carried on into getting introduced to cigarettes, right? A cigarette made me feel weird, right? So I started chain smoking cigarettes in middle school. And that progressed into other substances. Got expelled from school for um, exchanging dry goods at school. and. Got sent, to, got sent to treatment to avoid the legal trouble at 15. And no, at least from my experience, nobody's trying to get sober at 15 years old if they're already involved in that lifestyle. I remember being in high school and someone coming in, probably around in, in their mid-20s, comes in and like ex sharing their experience and how to stay away from drugs. Drugs are bad. And I'm like under the influence listening to them. I'm like, whoa, do you like, that's not going to be me, right? And here I am. <laughs> so... You know, as, as the journey continued, I continued to progressively get worse, and I didn't actually try to get sober until I was 19 years old. 
to hit 19. I checked into a rehab in Florida. I'm not sure if any of you have been down to Florida for rehab, but at least from my experience, it's not a very good place to get sober. I bought a weed pen while I was there, and people were nodding off in the re- It was not a good place. Um, but that was my first introduction to God. I never. I don't come from a religious background or, or a holy family, whatever you may call it. But I, I was introduced to the 12 steps, and, and I read the God part, and I prayed for the first time in my life. I said, God, listen, I don't know what, what the deal is with you, but if you're out there, I need, I need you to prove it to me. I need a sign. And it can't be like a, like a butterfly, like, oh, was that the sign? Like, it needs to be a clear-cut, whoa, like, burning bush moment. And God delivered that, and it was, it was an amazing experience. Ever since then, that's about where I stopped, the whole starting to believe in a higher power. I believed in the God and then went back home, continued on my uh, active addiction journey, and re- readdressed the, the getting sober part a couple years later, went down to Texas to get sober. And this is where it's like a big book boot camp. All day, you're in class learning about the 12 steps. They take you through it. You do a fourth step. You get a temporary sponsor to do a fifth step. And um, I had a wonderful experience, but I didn't really get a good grasp on two and three. You know, like I did the third, like I did the fourth step, got a good inventory written down, did the fifth step, but I didn't really understand what it meant to give my life and, and decisions or my decisions and actions over to God. So as I'm leaving the treatment after staying there for three months, they made a, a uh, strong recommendation that I stay in Texas, go to sober living, go to IOP and then readdress going home. And um, this is where the step three comes in, turning my decisions over to God. God was screaming at me to stay in Texas. But I was like, listen, God doesn't really barter, but I was trying to bargain, right? I was like, listen, I'll I'll go to sober living and I'll go to IOP, but I'm not staying in Texas. And um, so I went back home, kept it together for a little while. Um, But it wasn't very long lived. Ended up back down in Texas a few months later. And this time I gave up just a little bit more control. It's like, all right, listen, I'll, I'll, I'll go to the, the IOP, I'll stay in Texas. And it was great, but I still was trying to manipulate life to suit myself in one way or another. I was focusing on so many external factors, going to the gym, eating really healthy, making a lot of money. Those were the things that I thought success meant. So like that way, when I come back to Connecticut where I'm from and see my girlfriend, my mom, they all see that I'm doing well, right? I, you know, I got weight now. I'm not my face isn't sucked in. I got a little money, and I was totally distracted from the from the true curing, the true spiritual malady that I was dealing with. Um, so I moved out here to Pennsylvania on another journey of trying to get sober, and this is the time where I started off my journey with hitting the gym, eating a ton of food making sure that the externals look good, right? Starting to dress, you know, clean shave, whatever it may be. And um, I caught myself and was like, listen, man, you've made the same mistake before of focusing on every external factor to make yourself look better. When you go home and you're just the same guy that you were when you left, you just look a little different. So um, this go around, I'm really focusing on some internal stuff that I haven't really dealt with, really leaning on God and seeking God in every action. As a matter of fact, tonight, I um I didn't want to come here. You know, I was like, listen, I've been in a meeting every day this week. You know, I think I deserve a day off. It's late, and um, my buddy, my buddy Mike back there, he he overheard me discussing it with someone. I was like, yeah, I'm not gonna. I don't think I'm gonna go tonight. And then Mike comes in. He's like, where are you going? You going to a meeting? I was like, I was thinking about it. He's like, let's do it. And I was like, well, there it is. There's God right there telling me like, let's let's go let's go get after it. And, and see what happens. And sure enough, I get here. And similar to Ron was like, hey, you got 10 minutes to uh, 10 minutes of your time to talk about some gratitude. So I am super grateful to be up here tonight to see all your beautiful faces. And thank you for letting me share. <laughs> and have Steve come up. Good evening, everybody. I'm Steve. I'm an alcoholic. I'm just going to get rid of this mint. I feel uh, so fortunate to be here tonight to share with you how I'm feeling. Not just about recovery, about my life, about gratitude, about God's presence in my life, about all the gifts that I have on a daily basis, 
See, I'm one of those nut jobs that walks around, you know, with this extreme appreciation for the moment, like extreme gratitude. Man, you know, like uh, stuff goes wrong in my life every day, all the time. I got life problems just like everybody else, you know, but you know what? It's chicken. I always say chicken. It's garbage. It's nothing. It's nothing compared to the problems I have when I drink. Because when I drink, it's like Chucky's out of the box. You know, that's what happens. Like, I have this, like, chemical reaction. It's like, I'm, I'm David, what's his name, uh, in the Hulk. You know, I have a drink, and I just become a completely different person. You know, and uh, a person that at first seems fun. And, 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 and I entertain myself quite a bit with the drinking and the nut job that I become. But I also then live a life for the next, and it's not just a couple of hours. My drinking leads to other substances and they just go hand in hand for a couple of days. And, and, uh, and, I, and I live a life filled with disgust, disease, depression, drugs, you know, immorality, you name all those disgusting traits. That's, that's who I become, which is completely, a com you know, complete opposite of the way that I was raised, right? So super quick, one of six kids, second from the youngest, you know, mom stayed at home, dad went to work. We lived in the nice suburbs of Philadelphia out in like a Lafayette Hill area, right? And I was born in the 60s, so in, in the 60s, there was no color TV. It was black and white. You had three, six, and nine, and 17, 29, and 40, whatever the channels were, you know? And, uh, you know, there was no internet, no cell phone. You wanted to play, you got on your bike and you rode down to somebody's house and you knocked on the door, hey, can Johnny come out to play? Or whatever. So we lived on a hill. I was, you know, one of six kids. Parents, my parents, they would drink. But it wasn't, I, my, my father would have a highball or something, or a glass of wine when he came home from work. My mother, they never really drank. I never, there was never any issue. They were married 55 years. They never cursed. I remember one time my father said, shoot! Like, he was really mad. He wanted to say S-H-I-T, but he didn't. Shoot! And that was his way of, like, cursing. My mother was like, oh, Jim! You know, like, there was no cursing. There was no yelling. They got along, you know, and they liked each other, and they raised six kids. And uh, But the problem was, if you remember the 60s, you had Mayberry RFD. You had, uh, you know, the Waltons. You know, and you had to Leave It to Beaver, right? And then you had Dennis the Menace. That was me. I was Dennis the Menace on steroids, you know, slamming down five-hour super energies, like from the moment I was born. And, uh, you know... If they diagnosed me today, if they had diagnosed me then, the way that they diagnose kids these days, I'd be so juiced, I'd be so, I'd be loaded with meds, unfortunately. But uh, I was super active, super hyper, you know, had some, you know, learn how to learn over time to calm down and develop some coping skills, which I thank God for my mother, who to this day has been canonized a saint, and she's up there, you know. Uh, she should have been canonized the saint because of what I put her through. Uh, so, so as, as things went on, so I mean, I got like all this energy and all this. Then my mind is like, Meh! you know, and uh, lots of lots of mischievous troubles, teens, you know. But uh, and then I start drinking. Oh, oh, you know, that was like the answer because that motor, Meh! you know, like a motorcycle. That's stuck in, like, you hear these, uh, what do you call these ninja bikes, you know, they go, you know, that's what, like, my brain felt like constantly. But, boy, if I had a couple of drinks, whew, oh, thank God, you know, it helped turn it off. So, needless to say, drinking became a, a, just a way of life. I worked in restaurants all through high school, all through college, made a bunch of money, Paid, you know, went to a world-class college here in Philadelphia. Uh, you know, somehow I graduated, and I graduated with the right kind of degree at the right time in the mid-'80s and went into this tech technical industry that I'm still in. But uh, And then I started making money. And, oh, my God, 
you know, mid eighties, you know, disco fever, you know, other substances that just come out. I swear, I thought I was John Travolta reincarnated, baby. You know, Donna Summer was my girlfriend. We're tight, you know? And uh, I led this life of just out of control. And out of control led me to, you know, by day, I would be meeting uh, executives in corporations around the world, making, around the country, selling some stuff. But by night, you know, I was in the, I was in the bad, worst parts of town worst parts of town before we had cell phones well if cell phones may have come out by then but uh before navigation came out you know built into the dashboard of our cars and before navigation apps on our phone when you got off the plane you'd get a rental car and you'd, they'd give you a map so i'd get the map as i'm checking out of the uh parking lot at the airport or if i made it to the hotel but of course, there was like three drinks in the plane, a drink after the plane, before baggage came, after baggage came, before the rental car, after the, you know. <laughs> How they let me drive is just beyond me. You know, I should never have even left to leave the lot. You know, they should have like those spikes that pop up, you know, like for people like me. But uh, I would say, you know, can you tell me, you know, I'm new to the town, and I want to go and have a, <laughs> have a nice dinner, you know? And uh, they'd be like, but where should I avoid? And they go, oh, you want to avoid this section, bad section of town. Guess what? That's where I was. Whether I was in Chattanooga, Tennessee, Des Moines, Iowa, you know, Nebraska, you know, Milwaukee, you name it, I know all the rough sections. And there I would, there I, there I, you know, all that craziness, all by day, an amazing career, by night, you know, I'm out of my mind. Somehow I make it to rehab. Well, I make it to rehab. My first rehab. My sister was a secretary for the CEO at the uh, Horsham Clinic years ago. I used to go and visit her. Visit her when I was half shot from the night before. And uh, I used to say to her, God, these people, eh, sorry, son of the guns. You know, help, sick, you know. But this one lady, knew me and she'd see me coming in because I'd go through the cafeteria line to have lunch with my sister. She'd say, ah, oh, there you are. We've got a seat waiting for you. And I'm like, you know, sure enough, a couple months later, I'm back. I'm there as a patient. And, uh, you know, I'm going to just move on to my life today because it's absolutely spectacular. By this time, I'm 27, 28. I'm thinking, man, you're like, you're like out of control. You're out of control. You have a good job, making decent money, but you can't put two pennies together. You know, you're robbing Peter to pay Paul. You know, all kinds of just financial ruin. I didn't pay my taxes from 87 until 92. You know, you don't want to do that because the county and government eventually catches up with you. Um, I lived in multiple states uh, that, you know, uh, over that time, California, Texas, uh, never paid state tax for California. They found, they, they, these, the states do find you. I found that out. So this financial ruin. But the thing was this. After, the, after two weeks of being in the rehab for the first time, I really felt like, God, you know, these poor people. You know, they, these poor people. I really thought it was, this is bad, but the night before the rehab, I got my father's Cadillac. I got my hair cut, you know, I got my bling on, I, could wax, I waxed the Cadillac, right, because my car got repoed, I mean, pfft, you know, you know. <laughs> so, but I want these people to know, yo, I'm coming to the rehab, so I go cruising through Horsham Clinic, in my father's Cadillac, how, how, how sick, right, you know, because I wanted to see the pool, I heard they had a pool, a tennis court, and they did have an outdoor track that had, like, you know, the wooden uh, athletic thing. I'm thinking, hey, this will work. You know, chill out, dry out. Let me go have a drink and, th and think about it. And uh, but two weeks into that, I realized, uh, you know, when they finally said, well, tell me about you. And I said, well, I got this job, and I, got, I, I had this car, and I got this watch. And they're like, no, 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 we don't want to hear about that. We want to hear about you the person. And I was like, oh, that's off limits. I was so disgusted with myself. I didn't want to talk about me. 
I don't, you know, you couldn't get, to, I would not allow anybody in because I hated myself for the person that I had become. Well educated, good family, devout Christians, devout Catholics, good upbringing, parents put it, poured every, and I had all the opportunity. And here I am, lost the job, got fired, you know, broke, in debt up to my butt, had the cars repossessed, blah, 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 you know, what a mess. And here I am. So, uh, so I did the right thing and I split. I left AMA. You know, and uh, girl, had a girlfriend at the time who later became my wife. God knows how that, how that happened. And I uh, convinced her that someone was going to come after me and come after her so she couldn't be around me. But she had to give me 900 bucks to go pay these people off or like they were going to be knocking at the door. So that day I got her car, got some money, went downtown. We all know the story. Another three or four day episode. Four months of that and I went back to rehab. But by this time, I was dying. I mean, I was like, I was like begging to get back into rehab. You know, I had been pulled over. I, I think I was back in California at the time. And uh, I'd been pulled out of cars, uh, beat to a pulp, shot at, had the gun to my head, machete to my throat, all the wonderful things that happen when you end up in the wrong part of town at the wrong time, you know, trying to do craziness. And uh, I was kind of done. I thought, hmm, you're not going to make to your 30th birthday. You might want to try to rehab again. So I did. And I gave rehab a second shot. Right? And I stayed. And I began to open up. And I began to embrace the program. I, had, I was very fortunate to understand who was God, who was my higher power. Because so I had been raised, you know, my father was a Eucharistic minister in the Catholic Church. My father was not only a, a religious man, but he was a very spiritual man. Very spiritual. Backbone of you know, my life, although all he despite my, my ways. I won't go there <clears throat> right now. But uh, I'm going to move it up. So, you know, I go to rehab a second time. And uh, after, after the rehab, they suggested, you know, a couple of months in a sober house, which I did. I went to Morrisville, good friends, for five or six months. And I embraced the opportunity. And what I'm going to skim through the next 17 years, the next 17 years was a bunch of in and out, in and out, in and out. I'd get six months and go out. 30 days and go out. Two years and go out. I just couldn't get it. I remember one time I had five years, 11 months. But, you know, I got a promotion. I'm a big shot. I got a big title, a fancy watch. I'm too busy to go to meetings, man. I got five. I'm sponsoring all these guys. Come on, let me go to meetings every day. Hey, I got to do a forecast. I got to do an account plan. I'm kind of busy. I get to the meetings, you know, next week. So the meetings went from five a week, three a week, two a week, and eh, I'll catch up with that another day. Well, you won't believe what happened. The desire to drink came back. Wow. And I'll never forget it. I was thinking about a drink. And I couldn't just I couldn't get out of my head. Morning, noon, and night. The pain of wanting to drink. And as we've all heard, we've all seen before, you cut back on the meetings, it's eventually gonna get it's gonna get you. And it got me. Five years, eleven months I had a drink. That night, total the car. Uh, hit like five or six parked cars uh, going up Broad Street, 100 miles an hour or something. You know, decide to make a right hand turn, you know, at 100 and some miles an hour. You know, destroyed, you know, a lot of sit things and uh, lived to tell about it, you know, and there was a, a mess. What happened was, I, w I then put together another four years. And this was 18 years ago, so I have 18 years now, okay? This past November, November 15th was 18 years for me. But what happened? Well, what happened? 18 years ago, around, you know, early November, end of October or November, I had had four years. And I was at a dinner party with a bunch of other salesmen. Salesmen, saleswomen, salespersons. And we were down in Atlanta. And um, I was usually the designated driver, which was fine. 
And the company I was with they didn't care what you rented. So we rented this big monster truck, like a big Suburban or something. I had half a dozen people in the back. And I'm driving all of them around, including my boss, to go to a dinner. And uh, the bartender comes by and says, what do you want? It's a sit-down dinner. I said, I'll just have the you know, Pellegrino, which is my normal sparkling water. He puts down a glass of red wine in front of me. And for, I don't know why. I was going to meetings a couple times a week. I was talking to my sponsor hmm, twice a week. You know, I was, I, was, I was around the program. I was around the program. I wasn't in the program. I was around it. That glass of wine came in front of me. I looked at it. I said, man, where have you been? Drank it. Off I went for another three weeks. At the end of that, I was so, I felt so horrible, not only that I had blown another four years, but that I failed to ask for God's guidance and direction at the time, which I had been training my mind or you know, thinking to do. At the end of that, I said to myself, you know, if you'll give me one more chance, if you'll give me one more chance, I will try to see your will, accept your will, live your will, do your will. I will try to embrace the program. I will turn my life over to the care of God as I understood him. Okay? That was 18 years ago. I really don't think about drinking. I don't think about drinking. I see people drinking and I go, hey, I used to drink. You know? Yeah, I used to drink. People say to me, why don't you drink? Because I'm allergic to it. If I'm ever pushed by it by professionals or if I'll say, well, well I, I'm, I'm allergic to it. What do you mean? I break out in spots. New York, Miami, Las Vegas. <laughs> well, well, you know, and uh, it's the truth. I had one guy say, well, come on, Jonesy, can't you have a drink? Come on, come on. I said, you know what's going to happen if I have a drink? I'm going to take this knife and I'm going to slice your throat. You know, and I was like, you know, like back and I'm going to run, you know, he, he got the point. And uh, so that was 18 years ago. I'm going to wrap this up and just say, you know, today was like an amazing, like every day to me is amazing. Every day, every hour. I'm supposed to be dead. I wasn't supposed to walk away from the car wrecks. Eh, there was numerous. Airbags only work once. If you try to take an airbag after you've already exploded it and pull it out of your face and keep driving and hit another car, which I did, you know, and, and telephone poles and use your car as like a bumper car, bang, 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 you know, that, which is what I was doing. You know, airbags don't re, re you know, they don't work. They only work once. Uh, I had to do an investigate, you know, the, uh, and whatever. So, so the thing is this. Every day I'm alive is a gift. I start my day. My days used to start with, uh, you know, dear God, please help me with this deal. Please help me not to drink. Please help me not to smoke. Please, please do this, do this, do this, do this, do this for me. Uh -uh. My days now start with, dear God, thank you for yesterday. Thank you for the air that I breathe, the steps I take, the love that I have for you the love that I have for others, and I just go down this list of gratitude. Because every day, you know, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm blessed. And I'll, I'll, I'll stop in a sec. Today, I was in church, right? Now, I have been going to, for years past, you know, a certain type of formal church. Or, or let's just say a, an organized church. It doesn't matter what's Catholic or Lutheran, Episcopalian. But my children have uh, over the years been going to a non-denominational Christian church where they got the rock and roll in the beginning and the singing of the Christian songs and then the preacher comes out and preaches and then more music and then I'm thinking, man, this is a blast. You know, and today I had my two daughters, my ex-wife, my granddaughters, and they're all in there and they're holding hands and they're happy. I swear to God, I had tears rolling down my face because I had to sit in the one seat behind and I just watched. All the years I've been saying, I wish my children could feel the passion that I feel in wanting to have a relationship with Jesus, that I have. And now my youngest daughter, she's like, and she's got some other spiritual things that I'm not exactly too clear on. We're going to work on that. But she has, you know, <laughs> those that know, 
you know, those that know her, you know. Uh, but she's she's seeking this passion to 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 know God, to love God, to embrace God, to bring God into her life. And I'm thinking, I just got the best Christmas present I've ever had in my entire life. That to see my and my and they wrote me a letter last week because it was my birthday. She writes me these three page letters, uh, usually one or two pages, but now they're three. I'm her best friend. I'm her buddy. I, you know, blah, blah, blah. You're the rock of my own. I'm thinking, what kind of guys get that from their 27-year-old daughter? My 32-year-old likes being with me as well. Uh, 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 my, my, thir- my 30-year-old son thinks that I'm like this, you know, I'm, I'm like, my three kids like me. My grandkids like me. You know what? I'm, let's, just, let's just assume I have no money saved. I have no money saved. But I'm a very wealthy man. Very wealthy. Because I have the love, respect, and adoration, first and foremost, for myself, right? But that of my children and my grandchildren. I got it made in the shade. Thanks for letting me share. keep this short. I'm Anthony. I'm an alcoholic. Um, thank you guys, everyone, for speaking. This has been like probably one of the, my favorite meetings this uh, this year. Um, I'm just coming back from a, uh, I guess, relapse, but it was, long, it was a long relapse. It's one of them uh, five-year relapses. <laughs> um, it's a lot easier to go out than it is to come back in. Um, I want to keep this focus on gratitude because this is something that's been a common thread in my life for the, I don't know, I guess last month, couple weeks, whatever it is, it's like, um, you know, not everything is perfect in my life now. Um, and gratitude's a funny thing, but um, I can think back like my whole life and, you know, uh, I don't think I've ever been grateful for anything up until this year. I mean, like maybe short little spurts of things, but, you know, not really any real meaning, truthful uh, gratitude. And it's, uh, it's funny because I, I remember coming into AA and uh, like for real in 2015 and um, you know, I would, you know, I went through the steps. I had a sponsor, did all the work, sponsored guys, you know, meditated for hours and this and then all the spiritual stuff. And you know, I would want to feel gratitude so bad, um, and it was like, you know, fake it till you make it, and I, I mean, I faked it and faked it and faked it, and, uh, you know, I thought I had this relationship with God that, um, you know, I, you know, this God that, you know, uh, I don't know, was somewhere out there, I don't know, I can't get into contact with him, I don't know who he is, I don't know where he's at, but he's helping me, and, you know, things are, things are happening, but... You know, eventually, uh, because of my, um, and I didn't even know this, I, I ended up leaving AA because, uh, you know, I got I got this job, and, uh, you know, kind of like the common thread that everyone was talking about today, you know, when going out and, like, you know, stepping back from the program, stepping back from, you know, working on myself is, you know, I had the money, I had the girlfriend, I had the motorcycle, I had the car, I had the video games, the vacations, this and this and this, more things that I've ever had in my life that I accomplished myself, you know, obviously, you know, God was all over that, but, you know, I had, I was like, I'm, you know, I was in, you know, great shape, like every, you know, working out, went to Texas to the Bible or the, uh, AA boot camp. Like I had everything and, um, it, there I was still, there was still something missing. Um, and I had to go on this like long journey of different kinds of, uh, dry goods, wet goods, whatever kind of good, all the goods, um, and what, what, uh, what ended up happening, I, I had this spiritual, this wild spiritual experience, some, something that was real, something that was tangible, um, I found not the God of my understanding, Jesus, um, I had this experience where, um, I, 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 I didn't know who God was, and now I know who God was, 
and nothing had changed mater uh, materialistically in my life. And what happened from that, that period was like, I, I had something concrete, uh, uh, an image of someone to look at. And from that point forward, it was like, my life didn't change overnight. And this is probably about three years ago. And it's been a long journey and I'm about, I just had five, five months sober, uh, five days ago. And I, you know, so within that time period, I had been to four rehabs. I've been to three recovery houses. Uh, you know, I still wasn't completely submitting to, to a God, to a power greater than myself, you know, living it, obeying it, you know, loving God, you know, um, truly and completely dying to myself. Um, and, it, and it took a lot of work. It took a lot of, you know, a people. It took a lot of submission. It took a lot of hurt. It took, you know, I had to become humbled daily, every day. Um, you know, seeing these things that are getting in the way of me and my relationship with God and then getting rid of them. Um, you know, there's so many things um, in my life that I'm grateful for today, you know. Um, I'm great. I mean, I'm grateful I have a roof over my ha my head. I, I'm grateful I have like good guys that I can uh, interact with. I'm I'm grateful for this meeting. Um, I'm grateful for all you know the you know all the speakers that came before me and you know everyone uh, you know here. Um, you know, I'm grateful for my family. Like get it, getting to buy Christmas presents for people. And, and you know, it's expensive nowadays. It ain't like it used to be, but you know, it's it's a blessing um, that I get to do these things. Um, you know, I have pe so many people in my life that I, you know, I cherish and value, and um, I think like every day that you know, I wake up and I just thank God for the the complete turnaround that I, He's had in my life, and it's only a matter of you know, God, AA, the uh, the Bible, Jesus, church, the people in my life. It's a combination of everything, and. You know, I'm I'm really living now. I now now I know what it means to live. It's not about having all these things. It's about the relationship with God and a relationship with your neighbor. Um, so that's all I got. Uh, I'm here. Okay. Good evening again, everybody. My name is Brian. I'm an alcoholic. I do want to thank everybody for coming out here and sharing tonight. Uh, when I got here, you know, and Ryan gave me the rundown of what we were going to do tonight, he told him we would have to be, be having all these speakers come up here. I told him, well, I'll go up there and I'll close down the meeting as I usually do from time to time. And uh, whatever's left over, I'll fill the time. And luckily, my, my, my of course, alcohol, like worst case scenario mind was thinking everybody was going to come up here and share for three to five minutes. And I would end up here with like 20, 30 minutes to go. So I, I, I'm grateful for everybody for sharing so excellently tonight and uh, saying some great stuff. But I do feel compelled to share on the topic of gratitude. You know, as soon as Ron told me that that's what we were talking about, I want to just talk a little bit about, and I'll be quick because I know we're already over time, but share about my experience with this group and the gratitude that I have for this group to re really hope maybe convey to some people if you're not, you know, if you're just kind of around AA and not involved with it, the difference it can make in your life. But I, I joined this group in uh, 2017. I, came, I moved down here. I got sober up in Northeast PA in the Scranton area in 2014. And I had a home group up there, and I soaked up a lot of information. And I thought I knew, like, what service work was coming from there. And that consisted of, like, they made me the inner group rep after a year, and I would go to there once a month and bring back the information that nobody cared about. And I would, like, empty the coffee after the meeting, and I would dr drag the trash bag out back. And I thought, like, that was service work, just doing stuff like that. And so when I came to this group in 2017, after a period of kind of relying on self-will and kind of not wanting to surrender to the program, thinking I could do things my way and having these areas of self creep back in, right, I got involved with this group. And, man, I learned what service was. I started showing up here. I started putting on a suit, showing up, greeting people getting involved, actually getting to know the faces of the people that show up at this group. And it really prompted me to just get involved with a bunch of other meetings and really get involved with this entire AA community around here, man. And I was a member of this group for a couple of years there, uh, like three, four years. And I remember I would come to this group and from time to time I would get really concerned. I would think to myself, what would, it, what would we do if like a speaker canceled at the last minute and they threw me up there? Like that would be terrible, right? <laughs> I remember thinking that all the time. And that didn't happen, but what did happen was, uh, Around uh, the middle of 2021, the circumstances of my life, I, I, I got the opportunity to move away. I moved out to Colorado. I was out there for a year and a half or so. 
And about two years ago, right around this time, actually, it was December 19th of 2021, uh, my dad passed away, and I ended up coming back here. Um, and I went to, you know, I must have flown in on Tuesday or a, third, or a, a Tuesday or a Wednesday, because I went to the Big Book group, our sister group for this group, which is a great group. You should check it out if you want information on it. But I went there, and uh, Ron needed a speaker that week. You know, and I ended up coming up here and, and I didn't think about it for a second, right? Because I knew right away, I was like, this is exactly what I need to do. And this is what I need to do is show up for A and share my experience. Because that's how I get better, right? I show up here and I try to help other people. And that's like the whole A program right there. So I did that and I walked through that, you know, and I ended up moving back here. And I could speak a ton about the past year and how I've come back to AA and AA has always been there. But at its core, right, like it, this group has always been about service, right? And just showing up here on a consistent basis. Just, and just bit, not only coming here and enjoying and hearing some of the best speakers, which other people have talked about on a weekly basis, which has changed my sobriety. Like, I get to come here and I get to show up. And an experience I had this year, I was thinking about this. Uh, I, uh, I'll close after this, but we had a speaker in here earlier this year, and a, a lot of people showed out for him. He was a higher-profile speaker. And somebody came up to me after the meeting, right? And they, uh, I had never met them before, and they were like, oh, Brian, it's nice to meet you. And I had no idea what they were talking about, right? And we always record all the speakers, right? And these people had been listening to speakers that we posted from this group for years, you know what I mean? And it was just this awakening experience, how, you know, and I was thinking about, we had a speaker uh, during the workshop that we had here. And he said, you know, he said something to the effect of, like, you come to AA and you do God's work and God will use you in ways that you can't see, that you don't understand without your permission, right? And it was just like an experience like that where I realized if I just continue to show up here to AA on a consistent basis, I try to carry the message and do God's work, I get this incredible life as a result of it. And that's really been my experience and I just have a ton of gratitude for this group. But uh, thanks for letting me share. We'll close down the meeting here again. Thanks to everybody who came up here stepped up in a pinch to uh, share and to get this meeting together. Um, you know, usual announcements. It's always the meeting, you know, we've, we've put the food and the fellowship out at 8 o'clock, so feel free to show up early and join us. There's always a meeting after the meeting, so if you're out there, you're new, you're struggling, you want to get involved, get some information on some meetings, see some of us after the meeting. This group is in service. We have commissions at hospitals and institutions. We'll be doing one tomorrow night on Christmas Eve up in Quaker Town. If you're interested in coming out, see me or see Ron after the meeting. Uh, thanks again to everybody for helping out with the group, everybody who spoke, our readers, our greeters. Let's give one more round of applause for them. And if you do care to join us, we'll close down the meeting with the Lord's Prayer. We're going to circle up. We'll, we'll circle up. We've been circling up. <laughs> Got everybody. All right, we'll close down the meeting as always with a brief moment of silence for the still sick and suffering alcoholic inside and outside of these rooms, followed by our Lord's Prayer. Our Father. Thanks for being here. Good to see you as always.